Mr. Vice Chancellor, I have the honor to present to you the Right Honorable Helen Clark. Where does one begin the story of one of the most remarkable women in the world? Born in Hamilton, New Zealand, Helen Clark was the eldest of four daughters of a farming family at Tepayu in the Waikato region. Perhaps it is here on the land that she developed a passion for the environment and sustainability, but she soon became politically active. As a student, she protested against the Vietnam War and campaigned against having foreign military bases in New Zealand, seeds that would germinate into a passion, commitment, and action that would contribute to making New Zealand nuclear-free and known as a peacemaker, and propel Ms. Clark into leadership of her country, and then into one of the most prominent positions in the United Nations, championing the importance of social and economic development and speaking as an advocate for people whose lives were being severely impacted by and in many cases, destroyed by the ravages of war, oppression, and violence. Graduating from the University of Auckland with undergraduate and graduate degrees in political science, Helen Clark began her professional life as a junior lecturer and then lecturer there. She also became an active member of the New Zealand Labour Party, illustrating again her commitment to supporting others and promoting the rights and values of a socially just, tolerant society from the outset. Her talents were quickly recognized, and she held several influential positions in the Labour Youth Council, on the executive of the First Party's Auckland Regional Council, and then its New Zealand Council, and on the Labour Women's Council. With respect, Mr. Vice Chancellor, I am sure that these roles were important to Ms. Clark at the time, but importantly, they laid the foundation and heralded the track that she was to follow in the pursuit of making a difference. In 1981, Ms. Clark was elected to Parliament, and you might say that the rest is history. Blazing a trail as a woman in politics, her maiden speech to Parliament literally set the tone. She condemned the arms race, the deployment of nuclear weapons in the Pacific, and the global ambitions of the superpowers of the time. It is no exaggeration, Mr. Vice Chancellor, to comment that over the next few years, Ms. Clark held many ministerial posts in the government, bringing in sweeping social and economic change championing social equity, and again, sowing the seeds for roles to come in terms of sustainability, environmental care, and above all, human dignity for all. The stage was set for the next phase of her life as one of the longest serving prime ministers of New Zealand, and the second woman to hold that position. Demonstrating skills that astonish even her peers, Ms. Clark set about stabilizing the government of New Zealand by striking coalitions, bringing together partners that no one thought possible. Then she turned to business. Her government set the goal of making New Zealand the first ecologically sustainable nation, increased the minimum wage by 5%, introduced interest-free loans for students, overhauled the tax system, introduced paid parental leave, and promoted a vibrant and healthy economy. Unemployment fell to 3.6%. From her student years, Ms. Clark had shown an interest and commitment to international affairs and multilateralism. Her gov government strongly supported China's entry into the World Trade Organization and worked with world leaders in the fight against terrorism. Her government stood with Canada in opposing the unilateral invasion of Iraq. In 2009, after being the longest serving leader of a Labour Party in history and after completing nine years of Prime Minister, Helen Clark switched from national to international affairs, becoming the administrator of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Here, she worked to reform the bureaucracy, a task that resulted in UNDP receiving the accolade award by Publish What You Fund campaign of being the most transparent, and or, most transparent aid organization in the world. In 2016, Ms. Clark was nominated by the New Zealand government for the position of Secretary General of the United Nations, a fiercely fought and challenging competition in which Ms. Clark was ultimately not successful. For her outstanding contributions to so many aspects of life, Ms. Clark has been recognized by a plethora of international awards. It would be impossible to catalog them all here, but they range from the Danish Peace Prize for her work promoting peace and nuclear disarmament, the Nuclear Free Future Award for her groundbreaking efforts to rid the world of nuclear weapons, to the United Nations Environment Program's Champion of the Earth Award for her government's effort to promote sustainability initiatives, to a number of high honors from a range of governments, to cameo appearances in the popular New Zealand soap opera, Shortland Street, and to becoming member of the Order of New Zealand, the country's highest honor for services to New Zealand. But in case you think years in the corridor of power have fundamentally changed the girl from the farm in Waikato, let me share with you that Helen Clark is still passionate about the art outdoors. 
Famous for taking cabinet colleagues on cross-country ski sojourns, Helen Clark remains rooted in the beauty of nature and the wild outdoors. I am only sorry, Mr. Vice Chancellor, that we could not provide snowy landscapes for Ms. Clark to enjoy the trails in the Gatineau Hills. Mr. Vice Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate of Carleton University, for her outstanding and inspirational leadership to all, and for the resonance of her values with the spirit of Carleton University and our commitment to be here for good. And last, but by no means least, as a role model that we all try to emulate, I ask that you bestow upon the Right Honorable Helen Clark the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Helen, I wonder whether... I wonder when you hear your own story and you look at the graduates here, do you think back to what it was like when you first graduated? Did you ever imagine that the girl from the farm was going to become one of the most powerful women in the world? Did you ever imagine that you would have such an influence on societies, not just in New Zealand, but across the world? It is an absolute pleasure to stand with you and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Governors and on the recommendation of the Senate of Carlton University, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa. Congratulations. Vice Chancellor, Chair of the Board of Governors, graduands, honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen. And my thanks go to Carleton University for awarding me this honorary doctorate today. The citation you have heard tells of my journey from a childhood in rural New Zealand all the way to leadership of my country and then on to leadership on international development in my role at the United Nations for eight years ago. And in response to the question from the Vice-Chancellor, did I, when I was in your shoes as graduates uh, at Auckland University, ever think that the career path would take me to those positions? No, I never did. But what I know is that if you take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves, you can surprise yourself by where you will be able to go. My journey was made possible by many people and circumstances. Firstly, by my parents, who believed in me and backed me to be whatever I wanted to be. Secondly, by my teachers and professors at critical times during my education. They encouraged my interest in history and in political and international affairs. There were also the very strong networks of friends and supporters who stuck with me through thick and thin. And believe me, there are good times and very bad times in a career like the one I have had. And then I also want to acknowledge the role of the small open society in which I grew up, with its relatively egalitarian traditions, which enabled so many of us to believe that with enough dedication and effort, we could indeed reach our dreams. Canada and New Zealand, despite being far distant from each other, share rather a lot of basic values in common. And so I hope that my experience and what I say today may also resonate with those of you who are graduating. I do believe that fundamentally we are limited only by our imagination and that in our free societies, we can each be agents of change for the better. Our societies cannot stand still. They must evolve and transform to meet the needs of new generations and more diverse populations, and to cope with the impact of new technologies, major environmental changes, and the volatility all around us 
in geopolitics, which is the new normal. As individuals, we can each have a say about and contribute to how our countries respond to these trends. We can stand for mutual respect and valuing diversity. We can stand for opportunity and security for everyone. We can stand for the actions which will turn the tide on the damaging mega trends which are affecting our natural ecosystems. We can stand for peace and development globally. The stability and the living standards of Canada and New Zealand still remain distant dreams for many. In other words, we can each be part of the solution and choose not to be part of the problem. The choices I made took me into a long political career. And that is a rough and tumble way of life where one has to have a very clear idea of what one stands for and why one is contesting much sought after positions. Initially in that world, I was one of a very small number of women and we had to crash through a range of barriers in order to be taken seriously as politicians. Our combined efforts, however, opened the way for many more to follow us. And New Zealand today is known for the numbers of women who have held high office in our national life across the public, professional, civil society and private spheres. Those women include the three women prime ministers, of which I was privileged to be the second. While my career choice was to be in public life and decision making, I know that many of you will move after graduation to a wide range of other options. And in each of those, you too can make a difference for the better for others. I do greatly admire the inspirational leaders I meet in all walks of life, from those who want their companies to be defined by the commitment they make to sustainable development, to those who teach, who research, who provide health and other services, care for their local environment, and or work with and for the most marginalized populations in our societies and around our world. Carleton University has given those graduating today the foundation of a good education from which each of you can proceed with confidence to the next stages of your lives. And as you do, I urge you to focus not only on what will advance your own careers, but also on how you can contribute back into the communities of which you are part and more broadly into being a force for building a better world. We share one planet with finite resources and many challenges. It is incumbent on each of us to strive to leave it a better place than we found it. That is the essence of global citizenship. I congratulate all the graduates on their success and I wish each one of you well as you go on to make your mark in your chosen fields and in service to your communities and to our world. Thank you once again for the honour of bestowing me the honorary doctorate today. Thank you.